Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve day 11 of the JavaScript challenge and we have the problem sleep. This is probably the most important one yet because we're going to be learning about asynchronous programming, which is one of the huge advantages of JavaScript. I know I talked a little bit about the disadvantages in the previous videos. JavaScript is a little bit unique. It has a deep history of async programming, which contrasts with a language like Java which has a long history as a synchronous blocking language, which in today's age with like web programming and APIs is a pretty big disadvantage. I actually migrated some Java code at Google to non-blocking. I know that sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? But it just goes to show even places like Google have a lot of blocking Java code, which they're definitely not happy about, but it's definitely an investment if they want to migrate it. Getting into today's problem, we are given a positive integer, millis, and we just wanna write an asynchronous function that sleeps for this many seconds and it can resolve to any value. This last sentence might catch you off guard if you're not familiar with something in JavaScript called promises, which are kind of the backbone of modern asynchronous programming in JavaScript. And the thing is with JavaScript, any asynchronous function will return a promise and promises will resolve to some value at some point. But before we get too deep, let me actually show you some promises. The most basic example is set time out. Basically, this takes two parameters. It takes in for the first parameter, a function. So I'm gonna define a function, which maybe is just called hello. All it does is maybe console.log hello. Pretty simple. So we pass this function using its name into set time out. We're not calling this function. We're passing it in as like a parameter. And the second parameter is going to be the number of milliseconds that we want to wait. So a thousand milliseconds is one second. So set time out, which we're executing here is basically going to wait one second and then console.log hello. And I'm actually going to call it twice to illustrate that it is waiting. So now let's actually run the code and see what happens. We can see we're waiting and both of them printed at the same time. You might not have been expecting that and actually neither was I, but then I just realized we called both of these almost instantly. And then the next line is gonna be executed. They were both executed pretty quickly, but then both of them waited one second and then actually executed the value. But let me actually call the second one with 2000 milliseconds and then you'll see that we are gonna get that wait time we were expecting. So let's rerun this and you see we're waiting one second and then another second and we got the second one. So it's doing pretty much what we expect. So now let's take a look at what promises happen to be. A promise is a special object in JavaScript and it can be in three possible states. One is the pending state, which basically means it hasn't been resolved yet. And the second is the resolved state. And lastly is the rejected state. We'll be going through all of these. So don't worry if you don't understand them all quite yet, but the best way to show you what a promise is doing is to actually implement implement one from scratch. Well, rather construct one from scratch because it's an object we can construct with the new keyword. Every promise takes in a callback. A callback is essentially a function. We could pass that function in in line like this, or we could define the function separately down here. I think it's a little bit more clear for beginners to define the callback here. So I'm just gonna do exactly that callback. And typically the callback passed in to a promise will have two parameters. One is resolve and second is reject. You could technically name these whatever you want, but I would stick with the convention, which is resolve and reject. And it's actually not required, I believe, to pass both of these in, but that's just because JavaScript is a weird language. Usually you should pass both of these in. And the idea behind this callback is that we might do some kind of asynchronous operation, which is gonna take some time to execute. I'm not talking about like adding two numbers together. Technically that takes some time as well. I'm talking about doing something much more expensive, something like a network call or maybe a disk read, like some kind of IO, because we know the bottleneck with these types of operations is not in terms of executing code. We could be executing JavaScript as fast as we want. Our CPU could be going blazingly fast. It doesn't matter. The bottleneck behind a network call is sometimes infrastructure. You might be on the other side of the world. It doesn't matter what your computer is doing. You still have to wait. 
So if you are waiting for some kind of expensive operation, what should our code be doing? Should our code just be sitting idle? Should we just be doing nothing? Should the CPU just be wasting CPU cycles? Probably not. That's the motivation behind making JavaScript an asynchronous, non-blocking language. So when you load something like YouTube, there's a bunch of asynchronous non-blocking calls being made, but that's okay because JavaScript can continue to execute. That's not always the case with a language like Java. And that's kind of a very important concept to understand. This is one of the huge advantages of JavaScript. And this is why JavaScript is a powerful language, even though it is single threaded because you don't need a thread to wait for a network call or to wait for a disk read. These things can be done in parallel, even though some JavaScript is still running on the main thread. That said, the single threaded nature of JavaScript does sometimes limit CPU tasks. So if you are doing something super intensive, like adding a bunch of numbers together or a lot of computations, JavaScript might be a bottleneck in some cases. But let's get back to uh, the promise example here. Suppose we're doing some async synchronous call to mimic that I'm going to call set timeout. That's kind of a very easy thing we can do. And let's say the set timeout is just going to do something very simple like console.log hello. And it's going to execute after one second. Now, after that executes, let's say we want to resolve this promise. Well, if we want to actually wait a thousand uh, milliseconds, we should probably call our resolve over here because uh, we're calling the resolve out here, this is not necessarily going to wait the 1000 milliseconds. So to uh, fix this, let's actually take this resolve and move it inside of this anonymous function here. Basically, this function will execute, wait one second and then call resolve. And this is the function we pass into our promise and let's assign it to a variable, which we're just gonna call promise here. And remember, because of how hoisting works in JavaScript, this function is defined out down here, but we can still pass it in up here. So now with our promise, let me show you how this promise is actually used. After this operation is done and the promise has been successfully resolved, we can use the then method that belongs to every single promise. And the then method takes in a callback, which is you know just another function like this one. But in our case, I'm gonna do something more simple. I'm going to pass in an anonymous function, which is now actually going to console log hello. So now what this promise should do is after waiting one second, it will resolve. And then after one second, we will console log hello. Let's execute it and see what happens. Yep. It waited about a second, maybe a little bit more, but we did get what we wanted. Now there's a second method that belongs to promise, which is called catch. This one also accepts a callback. Let's say in this one, I'm going to pass in a similar function, but instead of logging hello, I'm gonna say error occurred or rather promise rejected because that's going to be a bit more descriptive. Now I'm going to change this callback to instead of calling resolve, it's going to call the second parameter, which usually corresponds to reject. Regardless of what you name these, the name doesn't change anything. The second parameter is always the one that corresponds to reject. So we take this reject and now we call it here. And now which one of these do you think is going to execute? Well, let's find out. We waited a second, promise dot rejected because rejected was called. Now this is a pretty contrived example, but normally what would actually happen in here is we would execute something usually with a try catch block. And we would maybe in the try make some kind of network call or some kind of async operation. If it's successful, then we call resolve. If it is unsuccessful, we execute the catch block, catching whatever error occurred. And then down here, we would call reject. So then when our callbacks execute, we actually know what happened inside of the callback. Was it successful or was it unsuccessful? And each of these methods actually takes a parameter. So for the reject case now, if some error occurs, maybe I want to call reject saying what error occurred or maybe passing some error object. But here now I'm gonna say error occurred. And up here, we do expect the catch to execute. I'm just going to get rid of the then because it's actually not required. But the catch now, this anonymous function we pass in actually has a parameter that will be provided to it because that's the parameter we passed in to reject. So it is an error message. And now instead of console logging this string, we're going to console log that error message. And you'll see this is what ends up being logged after a second. Well, I guess the way this try catch is set up, we're not guaranteed that this will execute. So I'm going to get rid of this try catch and then move this here. 
Now let's run it and you can see, yep, error occurred and it didn't even wait a second this time because we got rid of the set timeout. Now, what happens if we never call resolve or reject, if we just never do anything? Maybe in here, I'm just gonna console log something, which is great, but we never ended up resolving or rejecting this promise. So what would happen then? Well, let's clean this up a little bit. Let's just pass in some string here, error. And let's also add the then back, which takes in a function and let's just log console dot log success and let's see what happens now running this hello was executed but neither the then nor the catch was executed. That's because our promise is still in a pending state. Neither resolve or reject was executed. So our promise is in a pending state. And in this case, it'll be pending forever. And the last thing worth knowing about promises in JavaScript is that there is the finally block, which is executed regardless of whether the promise is resolved or rejected. This can sometimes be good for like cleanup related tasks. If there's some piece of code that you always want to execute, which is basically in this case might just be console.log promise completed whether it's been resolved or rejected. Do you think it will execute in this case because our promise is not resolved or rejected? Let's see what happened. In this case, no, it was not completed. But you'll see now when I uh, get rid of this hello and I change this to a resolve and then rerun it, we ended up getting success and promise completed. But if I change this to a reject, we'll get something similar, which is error and promise complete. The finally executes regardless of whether the promise is resolved or rejected. Okay, that's probably more than you ever wanted to know about promises, but I promise you this is a very important concept, no pun intended. So now we can finally get back to the problem. What were they asking for again? Oh yeah, write an asynchronous function that sleeps for this many milliseconds and it can resolve to any value. In this case, let's return a promise. Well, we have to construct construct one using the new keyword. And we're going to take a callback, which is a function. I'm going to define it down here because I think it makes it a tiny bit more clear. Well, I probably have to define it before I actually execute the return statement. So let's uh, move it up here. This is our callback. We're going to be passing into the promise. It's going to take two parameters, remember, resolve and reject. And we want it to resolve to any value. They say resolve, not reject. So we only need to execute the resolve and it should only happen after this many milliseconds. Well, that's what our set timeout is for. So we pass in resolve, which resolve is a method. Remember, we're not calling resolve. We're passing resolve into the set timeout, which will then be executed after this many milliseconds. So this is our callback that we are now gonna pass into the promise, which is going to be returned. And of course, we could have just written this as like an inline function here, which is typically how I write this kind of code. But I think for beginners, this might be a bit more readable. So let's run this. And as you can see, yes, it does work. There's a couple last things I wanted to mention, which is what does this asynchronous keyword mean? Well, let's go back to our notepad here. You can kind of see how this kind of code can get messy when we have so many callbacks like this. And sometimes you can even have nested promises, promises that return promises, and things can get really messy. There are other libraries for dealing with that sometimes, but JavaScript has a built-in function which is a sync away. Oh, These are two keywords that are really important. When you make a function like this, let's say hello, and you make it an asynchronous function, by default, this will return a promise. We know by default, if this is not an asynchronous function, it will return undefined, right? So if I call hello now and log it, this is going to return undefined. It's not returning anything. So what's going to happen? This is going to return undefined. Let's do that. Yep undefined and let's get rid of the code at the bottom so we don't confuse ourselves. Well, I commented it out, but now if we change this to an asynchronous function, now what's the return value gonna be? Let's just run it and prove it to ourselves. Oh, it's a promise because asynchronous, the keyword will implicitly convert every function's return type into a promise. So if I change this hello, and I just return an actual string, which is hello, and run it, it will do what we expect, logs hello. Now, if I change this to a sync though, it returns a promise which resolves to this string. JavaScript does that under the hood, which is really confusing for beginners, or at least for me, because I came from a language called C++, where you kind of have to manually do everything yourself. Now, let's run this and see what happens. Oh, we got a promise 
that resolves to hello. And we can take it a bit further. We can actually, on this hello, we can add that then keyword. And once it resolves, we can take that return value that it does resolve to, which let's say is the response and then console log the response. And you'll see that this should log the return value that we get from over here. And it does indeed do exactly that. So what's the point of the async keyword? Well, it goes with another keyword call await. And that allows us to not need to do these callbacks. We can instead call hello, then use the await keyword. What this does is it kind of acts as the dot then keyword. It's just another way of writing the same code. We can call await on this and then get whatever the response happened to be like this and then console.log the response, which should be the same. Let's run it to prove it. Okay, this is a good error. I think I know what's causing it, but I'm gonna get rid of this await keyword as well over here. The await keyword can only be used in other asynchronous functions. And the reason is that we don't want to block the main thread. And in this case, this is kind of like our entire program. So we don't want to block the execution. We have to use await in a function. So let's actually just put all this code inside another function let's call it helper and then move this code inside of there and now if we try it we're actually going to get another error because we have not made this function asynchronous so now let's make the function asynchronous and then let's actually call the function as well down here so executing helper and then running this we did get hello. Basically, await will say that this line of code must execute before the following lines of code within the same function. If we change this without the await keyword, that's not necessarily going to be the case. And let's run it to actually prove that. Okay, we got a promise, which makes sense. That's what hello is returning, but I guess this line did end up executing before this because this isn't actually a real asynchronous function. So let's actually change that. And to do that, I'm going to define another method up here, which is called sleep, which is basically the solution for our problem today. I actually just, I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste that and just clean this up a tad bit. Now, this is an asynchronous function and here we're gonna call sleep and we're gonna sleep, let's say, one one second and we're also going to await because we don't just want sleep to execute and then immediately return hello we want to wait one second and then return hello so now we know when this code executes hello yes is going to execute but it's not immediately going to return the promise response so when we try to log that response let's see what happens oh we got a promise that is currently pending now if we want to actually wait for that promise to be completed before before we log it, we have to add the await keyword. I hope you're starting to get the idea of why we have the async and await keyword. It's just a different way of writing this. I mean, don't get me wrong. This is definitely very, very confusing the first time you see it. I don't expect you to understand it entirely. Now let's run this now that we've added the await keyword and you see it waited a second, right? It didn't immediately console log because yes, it did have to wait one second before executing the next line, but it did get the actual response. Okay. Okay, enough of all this. Let's get back to the second solution I wanted to show you. Thankfully, it's not gonna be super complicated. Remember what the problem is asking for. Just wait this many milliseconds and resolve to any value. In here, we actually don't even need to return anything. We can create a promise, which takes in a function, which remember always has resolve and reject as parameters. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna execute set time out and it's going to resolve this promise so we're going to pass in resolve after this many milliseconds instead of returning this promise i'm just going to await this promise so normally this function would return undefined but since it's an asynchronous function this is returning a promise of undefined and that promise yes is going to resolve after this many milliseconds and we can do that because they mention it can resolve to any value we don't care what the value is. We don't care. Even if it's undefined, that's perfectly valid, I guess. So let's run this to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. This was a really fun video to make and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.